Hello, everybody. We're back at Salute. I'm joined by Tim uh, in front of a, a very nostalgic looking game for a very nostalgic period. So this is uh, a very British Civil War time? Yes, yeah, this is 1938, um, alternative history. Uh, we've taken on um, using 54 mil because of the theme of Salute 50 years on. Yep. Anybody who's 50 years plus is going to remember the dinky, the airfix, the matchbox, all those sort of things yeah. done in the traditional Britain's toy soldier style. Yeah, that was the thing that drew me immediately to it was the the, the Britain's look of the toy soldiers, the big tin cast, 50 mil enamel painted soldiers. Uh, so for people who haven't played or don't know uh, about the very British Civil War, what sort of a game is it apart from the alternative history? Is it sort of large battles, small scales? It can work in either way. Um, it's designed anything from platoon skirmish level right the way up to, I mean, one year we had naval engagements here. Mm. I had an aircraft carrier, three battle cruisers, um, all in 28 mil. Yeah. So um, it depends. It depends how you want to play it. And again, it's a kind of game where you can play how you want it played. Yeah. So there's no real hard and fast sort of parameters to it. Uh, it's a, a fascinating little interwar period. I've always been drawn to it because you have this uh, fascinating branching narrative where the, the king, right, the king didn't abdicate, and Oswald kicked off with his fascists. Yeah. The, the idea was that the king decided he wasn't going to abdicate, um, and then used Mosley and the right wing element as his sort of government yeah. uh, and then the the coalition faction became the uh, the, the religious um, Anglican League people like that mm. and obviously the communists mm. and massive sort of input in terms of historical information mm. because all those bits existed yeah um, even Churchill was originally going to run, run the King's party back in 1937 38 so it was very much based on a sort of history that could have happened yeah could have happened so what is the scenario set up for the, the people to see today here at Salute? Um, well, what we're going for today is um, we're, we're taking a bit of Jews and Worcester. So the originally, um, Sir Roderick Spode, who was their character that was um, lambasting, um, lampooning uh, mostly, yeah. he formed the Black Shorts. And he's out for electioneering. So he's on the table already. So we have these chaps in Black Shorts there. Um, his weakness was the fact that he is as, as a leading fascist leader and possibly dictator of the country, also ran a ladies underwear design firm in Bond Street, Ulalia oh. Soirs. Yeah. And whenever Jeeves wanted to stop him being a bit too over the top, just had to whisper, Ulalia Soirs, sir. And you can see there are a number of posters as objective markers that have to be removed because we can't have our dictator being sort of lampooned like that. So that's the idea behind it. Uh, it's a fascinating setup. I absolutely adore the use of the, the the 54 mil as well. It's something that is starting to creep back into gaming. I've seen uh, Mark Copplestone recently has started to do Mark's Little Wars. Yes. Um, so everything old is new again. And it's, it's always nice to see a new way or a new way of showcasing older figures to people. Because I think sometimes there's always the idea that the sort of the old school single cast metal figures um, are to be sort of shunned in favour of the new multi-part plastics and that sort of thing. But uh, but I was like seeing the old on the table. It just has such a great look to it. Yeah, and I think the thing is, um, it goes back to the old days of when you were having to think about what you were doing with the figure. Yeah. You get the Airfix magazine and Charlie Catchpole and how do I convert that first war German to a, a British infantry in the Zulu War or whatever. And this is very much like that. And I think that's the nostalgia bit that kicks in. Um, nowadays, as I said this earlier, you can, you can think the most obscure conflict and there'll be both sides, but not just one or two figures, Holy 50 Indians. figures yeah, of each side. So this sort of makes it a little bit more back to the old, old ways. Yeah. 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 Have to improvise, adapt and overcome. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure speaking to you. I hope you have a fantastic salute, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, what do you think of this, guys? Let us know below and uh, we're gonna prowl on and see what else we can find for you. Hello, folks, I'm at Salute and I'm joined by Andy Cal, Lord 
Callum, sorry. Uh, and we're over here at uh, a stunning table set up for Nevermind the Bill Hooks, uh, which has just had its second edition, Andy. That's right. The, uh, the Nevermind the Bill Hooks Deluxe, or Bill Hooks Deluxe, as we call it. Yes, the original game was just Wars of the Roses, but the book now takes it into the Hundred Years' War and the Italian Wars and things around there. So you've got anything from 1350 to about 1525. Um, so that's been out a few months now. Uh, here we've got one from the uh, Italia chapter. Uh, so this is the Italian Wars, about, about 1500. We've got uh, a small, rather scratch and weak looking Italian force about to be overwhelmed by some veteran Spanish coming down the pass. But they might give them a bit of a fight before they get there. Here we've got a couple of ships, just as a hint towards what's coming out next, which is never mind the boat hooks, which is going to be uh, a free color supplement with the June. Uh, 2023 issue of War Games Illustrated. So, for people who haven't played, uh, never mind the Bill Hooks before, uh, what sort of scale are you looking at when it comes to the actual tabletop game? Okay, you're looking at armies of about 80 to 100 figures. Um, uh, your game should be playable in about an hour and a half, so or even shorter if the dice goddess wills it. So, for example, the other night on Thursday night, I, I got through two games in two hours so that's really good going so it's a, it's a it's a quick dirty and uh very uh luck based game so it's all on turns of the cards and rolls of the dice so you don't mind too much if you lose so you just want to have another go yeah and when uh boat hooks comes out then are you looking at a similar sort of model count but on, on ships, on ships? Yeah. so you're still looking about 80 men but maybe, maybe four or five maybe a few less you're going to have four or five ships each with about 18 to 24 figures on so yeah it's going to be about the same yeah yeah. I've been looking forward to that whenever my subscription comes in. Hey, uh, it's a beautiful setup, and I absolutely love, never mind the bill hooks. Excellent. I've got my deluxe edition at home, well, but I haven't well, even well, cracked well, the yeah. spine on it yet, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, folks, if you haven't checked it out, it's a, a fantastic system for getting really interesting uh, historical games onto the tabletop because you have a really nice clash and sustain. You don't have one huge unit sort of running rampant throughout the entire battlefield that you get in some games. Yeah. Um, it, it gives you that real feel of the grind of historical warfare. So yeah, definitely check out, never mind the bill hooks, and keep your eye out for uh, June. June edition of War Games Illustrated. June's War Games Illustrated yeah. for the uh, the free boot hooks. Absolutely, good, good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. All right, folks, if you have any questions, pop them below. We're going to move on and speak to you again soon. Bye bye. Hello, everybody. We are back at Salute once again. I'm joined by Mark from yes. Art Armor. And uh, an interesting table with some interesting figures on it. So do you want to tell us what the battle is or what is deployed on this board? But then, then we'll get into the figures and the rest after. The, the battle, it's a Seven Years' War battle, 1758. It's the Battle of Domstadt, where the Austrians attacked a Russian supply column, which is 45 kilometers long. Um, they captured it and most of the men. Mm. And the, Rus and the Prussians didn't even know they were there. <laughs> so that's what it's depicting. So, now that that's out of the way, flat miniatures. Yes. I'm a fan of flats. I was on holiday in Sweden last year and I went to uh, their army museum. And in the upper, uh, upper level of the army museum, they have a history of flats in Sweden from the 1500s onwards. And it's unusual to see, especially in this day and age, actual metal flats. So where did this come from? Um, I first got a collection of 600 Prussian and Austrians back in 1979, 60 quid's worth, which was a bargain. Um, and I've just been collecting them ever since. Um, I fell in love with them and they're unusual, but in the 60s and 70s, flats were quite common. Because yeah. a lot of them, the lads who gained, men who gained, gamed mm. were in the armed forces stationed in Germany so they bought them when they were in Germany yes but after about late 70s um, they were a bit harder to get so they lost popularity so you very rarely see them and because it's the 50th anniversary of the salute show I thought let's have a bit of nostalgia and do a bit of a retro thing so I brought the flats me collection of this is the first time they've actually been out in public wow <laughs> so presumably then you are responsible for all of the painting as well. I've painted every one of the figures, yes. How long has this been going on for? Because it, presumably you're not still adding to this. 
Uh, well, uh -huh. it was another box arrived from Germany yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I'm, I'm oh, adding okay. to them. Um, as I say, I've been collecting for 43 years, but I actually only started painting them at the COVID lockdown. So they, these have all been painted in my spare time <laughs> since 2020. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the amount of gaming tables that I've seen over this this day where I've heard that, it's, it's been a, a monumental task has been aided by uh, not being able to go out and, and uh, waste your time doing fun things. Well, I'm actually a professional model figure painter. That's what I do for a living during the day. This is done oh. in your spare time. <laughs> I mean that takes that takes dedication and commitment. No, it's madness. Yeah, well, maybe you should be committed. Maybe that's it's how it goes. It's a vanity project. I've always wanted to. I've collected them. I wanted to show them, and I've put the effort in to get them on the board. And I've, the appreciation I've had from people today has been overwhelming. Yeah. Men who said, "I remember these back in the seventies." Young lads who are looking at them and going. <laughs> You can't understand why you can't see the figure from back to front. And it's been fascinating. Are, are they any harder to hit when they're coming square at you then? Well, you just go that one. It's a bit easier because <laughs> a bit more room. It's better enfilading them. But no, it's, it's, as you see, you've got to look at them from the side yeah. to get the true effect. But I think they're just fascinating. And yeah. it's just an unusual thing to see now. Well, yeah, very, very much so. Very common on the continent, of course. Yeah. Much more common on the continent, but not over here. Is there a game then that you were playing with these today? And uh, we're actually using the war the war game rules by Charles Grant. Wow. Um, so we've got all of the ranging sticks, the oh, can the canister. I've not seen that since. Uh, <laughs> I think Edward Woodward showed it off with yes. Peter Gilder the last yes. time I seen one of those being so used it, in public. So I made sure that I had all the ranging sticks, the movement sticks as well, the, yeah. to build into it. So. We've actually basically, this is the first time, as I say, they've actually been gamed with. There was a young lad who t has been here three times and has been absolutely fascinated with them. So we'll just let him play. <laughs> but that's what it's about. That, that is lads into the hobby. 100%. And, and showing them that there's so much more than some people may think out there. There's, there's a whole there's diverse... There's different, different types of figure. Yeah. Not everything is the solid round mm. paper. It, it's different, yeah. you know, and that's the thing. But as I say, it's a bit of nostalgia harking back to the 70s. As I say, it's the first time I've had them out on display. And let's be honest, my vanity and my vainness has gone through the roof this day. <laughs> well, that is what I like to hear. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Nice to you. And I've, I've absolutely blown away just by the setup here. The length and breadth of it is absolutely sensational. What? The, the table is designed so any gamer can do it. Mm. It's baseboards, polystyrene with trees. Anything here can be done by any gamer. Yeah. You don't have to buy specialized terrain. It can be done by clubs or whatever. I think that's that's the most important thing is showing people that you don't need to you don't need to spend three, four hundred pounds on on a bespoke piece of resin. You can sit down with some polystyrene or teddy bear fur for your fields and a bit of paint and away you go. It's the overall effect. Yeah. As long as you put a little bit of effort to match things up. Um, this morning, we were delayed getting down, so I had to set up this morning. This went down in an hour and a half from start to finish. Well, that's, that's what you want to see. And, I mean... Anybody who's come through the door here, I'm, I imagine we're drawn towards this just oh. for the, the sight and spectacle. The number of people who said, they walked in and said, well, this is the best game we've seen all day and they just walked through the door. <laughs> <laughs> so, must have got something right. <laughs> well, there we go. We'll end on that high note. Let us know what you think below of the flats, folks. Uh, we're going to move on and see what there is to see at Salute. Take it easy. Hello, folks. We are back at Salute once again. And this time we've stopped off by an amazing set of boards done by the Bexley Reapers. Uh, ticking all of my nostalgia boxes right off the bat, it is a light cycle game from Tron. So uh, tell me all about this. Let's start with whose mad brain child was, idea was this? So this was a uh, conversation in a pub about 11 o'clock at night after we had just done a salute of what could we do? Um, and this happened pre-COVID. And then I accidentally mentioned to Justin that we were going to do it. So here it is. Uh, and that's how it grew. We lost the rules three times, had to rewrite three times. Uh, but otherwise it's come out as a good game. So 
explain what people are doing then. If, if people are unaware of Tron, and if you're unaware of Tron, you're what's wrong with the world. You're why I'm not getting a third part of that trilogy. But apart from that... Uh, so everyone's got a light cycle. Uh, they also get an identity disc. Uh, on Excellent. the back of the identity disc, you've got your moves. You do your moves with your speed and the action you want to take in secret. You all show at the same time and then you will move at the same time. So no one knows what anyone else is doing. Okay. Um, as you move forward, you put the light trail behind you. And the idea is that you stay alive and the others drive into yours and de -res. And like the light cycle itself then, presumably the... Uh the trail doesn't go until somebody is de -rezzed. Yeah, so the light cycle uh, and the trail remains up until that player hits a wall or hits someone else or hits themselves, which has happened numerous times a day, uh, and then their entire trail disappears, which sometimes saves other people. Well, yeah, well, we've all seen the movie. It's how, it's how life works. Uh, it's a fantastic looking setup on both the board and the miniatures. Who's responsible for this? Because I seen it yesterday strobing through all the colors, which was amazing. Yeah, so uh, we have a member of the club who does wonders with electronics and lighting, and he made our light boards. We've got someone else with numerous 3D printers who have done the models, the recognizers, the tank, and then a club effort to make the light boxes, the board, and just get it all ready for today. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a wide effort, but there's some people that put in the extra time to get us there. Um, and I think we can get the colors strobing through. Can you strobe the colors? Yes. Ooh, exciting. That'll be one for you looking down there, Shay. Um, there's a few other bits and pieces kicking around that I want to point out at this table as well, because there are the recognizers, and I desperately, desperately want the recognizers and the tank to play a part in the game. Presumably they don't. Uh, no, they don't. The whole game is taken up just on the light boxes. The rest is just to make it look pretty. Uh, because we do like a board that uh, gives you the feel of the game we're playing. Yeah, I mean, well, you've got the pull of energy right there. Yeah. Uh, I, I can just see Tron and uh, Flynn. So we went with uh, Tron 1 yeah. for aesthetics, but Tron 2 for lighting. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, and, and audio, because under the table, there's also the soundtrack playing to keep people in the mood. No, well, yeah, I've just heard that kicking in. Oh, oh my word. No. <laughs> A lot of people have seen this already because we put up pictures on the live blog earlier today, so we had to come. But we just happened to come back to see that you've got this. Yeah. So we've been lucky and won most innovative game of Salute 50. Um, we're really proud of that one. Uh, it, it's great. It, it'll go to all the club members that put effort in, uh, and it'll probably go home to the person that made the light boxes. It's, it's very fair. Uh, I think it's been an amazing setup. And we've had real difficulty getting anywhere near here to actually talk to you today because both tables have been solidly chopped. And I imagine in a minute, Shay's going to be muscled off to one side so that people can continue to play. Yeah, but I, can, I can see a queue forming. So, um, yeah, well, we carried on. We're here all day and it's been three deep at times. So there's only seven of us running it. So we have to take time to try and get through them. Uh, one final thing. If people want to find out more about the Reapers, who are you, where do you live, where do you game? Uh, Bexley Reapers War Gaming Club in Bexley, South East London, North West Kent, depending on how people like to say it. Um, we play everything. We don't really have a set game. Um, meet on Mondays, uh, come down, chat. That's about it, really. We're just trying to be a friendly bunch of guys and have fun. There you go. Uh, I think this, in and of itself, should be worth people's time and seeking out the Bexley Reapers. Uh, it's been magnificent and it's really great to see that they've got an award for their trouble as well. Uh, let me know what you think below folks. We're going to head on and see what else there is to see. Hello everybody, we are back at Salute to take a look at some more fantastic tables. I'm joined by Anthony and Ben uh, from Funny Badger. Funny Badger. Funny Badger. Yeah. No. You've actually got quite a few different tables arrayed here, so we're going to do a gentle walk and uh, Shay will try and keep up with us. That is the plan anyway. Who wants to explain this magnificent beast to me first? Well, Slit's Revenge. Um, originally 1977 Steve Jackson Games. We came up with the idea about 10 years ago to turn it into a game here and stupidly decided to make it into this monstrosity, which worked tremendously well. Um, it's just such a fun game. It's simple rules. It's been busy all day. We've had kids on it. We've had grown-ups pretending to be kids on it. Uh, we've also given it a little 2020s twist this year, turning it from Snit's Revenge into Snot's Revenge. Some nice little COVID characters in there. 
Yeah, got to be a little bit topical, even with the ball games. And that's yeah. that, really. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I do appreciate the fact that you've got a nice vertical board game, essentially. Yeah. yeah. It's something I've talked about with the guys a few times about maybe doing something like a Prince of Persia side-scrolling game, but do it vertically. Because everybody sees board games and they get lost on the table. Um, especially when you're in something like Salute where there's so many fantastic uh, 3D boards. But then actually being able to put uh, a vertical vertical board game out there is just so eye-catching. But also, but also, you know, we were told that no participation games could bring a wobbly Tower of Doom right. to Salute. That was their words, not ours. And so we bought a wobbly Tower of Doom. There you go. Well, you know, <laughs> it's not that wobbly. It's a little bit doomy. Wobbly. You know, a wobbly than it through. Well, that's the best way. Uh, so that's our first game. The second game is uh, an old favourite returned. Oh, yes. Project Fear. So tell me all about Project Fear. I hear it's a lie. <laughs> well, depends which side of the fence you're on. We basically have post-apocalyptic, post-Brexit Dover. The last remaining Remainers want to leave and get on the last ferry to France. The leavers want to force the Remainers to remain. So it's an asymmetrical skirmish game of escape and capture. And yeah, the idea is to get your remainers to get down the board and get on the ferry and get out. So who built this little ferry terminal? Me. Just out of foam board, scratch built, bits of cardboard, a couple of bits of Fenris terrain and yeah, everything else is just scratch built. I built the end Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Built the end bit in the ferry. So the ferry oh, itself is a yeah. I look at it. Claiming I mean, all the credit again. Yeah, yeah. That, that ties it all together. Yeah. Really keeps yeah. it together. So, so a lot of the vehicles are, are me, yeah, but really it's a very much a joint effort that we just sit on Zoom because we're at opposite ends of the country, come up with ideas, build things together. You know, he sends me the dimensions of this bit of the board so I can build build the end of the board. And this game is a wonderful thing because it has never got old. You know, every year something has changed in politics. We've been able to add something to it um, and we've kept it. You know, Rishi Sunak is on this board this year. Uh, tomatoes are on this board this year, which is unusual because there aren't any tomatoes anywhere else. But yeah. What about turnips though? They can be substituted for tomatoes, I think. We have some British veg on here. Yeah. Um, I think this is Fenris again. This is um, printed terrain um, right. and they are British, British vegetables. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what you need. So. Uh, Gameplay-wise then, I see an awful lot of weird and wacky models down below. What are people playing with or playing against here? Because I see I see unicorns. Yeah, well, the uh, the unicorn of the Sunny Uplands, to be precise. Um, that's a zombie-side figure. It's a, a zombified unicorn, which just seems to fit the thing perfectly. Uh, but we've got miniatures from all sorts of people. Crooked Dice have been excellent in supporting us, so have hassle-free miniatures. Uh, we've got a few uh, Annie... Um, Spaz Squido, Squido miniatures. Uh, we got some 3D prints from various places. Jeremy Claridge made the Brexit shitstorm out of a hot glue gun. Uh, there's loads of stuff. We've got a 3, 3D printed fr uh, fridge to represent Boris because, let's face it, he spends most of his time in one. And then there's other little bits and pieces. So it's a nice collection of a lot of companies that, that we're quite close with. It's, it's certainly eye-catching and a nice satirical take on things when things go uh, pear-shaped, which is, you know. It's also gentle, you know, we, we've had people play both sides and, and, you know, we're not, whilst we obviously have a view and this game is very much a Remainer game, we've had people who are very, you know, Brexit supporting play this game and, and have a good time playing it. And that was always our aim was that it would be played by people, you know. Which is what you want in any game is that people can take, take part and not feel like, not feel like they're the uh, the target of a, a particular uh, game or, or scenario. It, if someone can come along and play a game that's about a serious subject and laugh their balls off, that's a win. And and that's been happening since 10 o'clock this morning. So Jokes per square inch. Jokes per square inch. Yeah, I, well, I've noticed they've been going like that since this morning because every time we've come past to talk to you before now, we couldn't get near you or near any of the tables. So th this was my last final attempt to, to show people at home that's, what is going on here. That's nice to hear. It's, uh, it, it has been a busy day. It's been a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun. So this, exciting and new? This is the new board. This is Tractor Brigade. Um, the object of the game is, as any Ukrainian tractor driver would know, uh, 
drag to the end of the road, pick up a Russian tank, bring it back to the farm. First one back wins, other objectives on the board. Again, a lot of good fun, pokes around a very real and sensitive subject. So we've put we've put um, four Ukrainian heroes on here. We have um, the the Klitschko brothers. Yes. Um, we have Mila Jovovich, who's driving a um, he's driving a slightly unusual tractor because mm -hmm. it, it, it's based on the Fifth Element taxi and it's a Traxi, probably a Traxi, I would imagine. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have um, who's the others? We've got Andrei Shevchenko in his Chelsea tractor, which you know, little yeah. joke there. And finally, of course. President Vladimir Zelensky in his guise as Paddington because he voiced Paddington in both of the Paddington films um, when they were released in the Ukraine. Um, this game has been incredibly popular today. It's just yeah. it, it's just fun. You know, you're playing a sort of a mad sort of wacky race, run up the board. You're being chased by Putin on a bear. Um, shirtless Putin on a bear. Shirtless, of course, he's perfectly done. He that. would so, have it no other way. It's a brigade model, so we had to import that one from America, and but it's a, a lovely model. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, it's been. It's this has just been hugely fun to play. It's a bit of a departure because the other two, we'll see Trumpocalypse in a minute, but but um, the Brexit game over there are more of a skirmish game. This is very much a racing game. A racing game. Yeah. yeah, just a race game straight to the end, Absolutely. and and again. A beautifully designed and laid out board as well. Thank you. Uh, which I, I think it shows when you're doing a demonstration game. I've spent a lot of time looking at some, you know, 14, 16 foot long games and they look magnificent, but you can do exactly the same amount of fun in a, what's that? One foot by one four? One by six. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I, I'd argue yeah. you can do more fun yeah, because we're incredibly fast. Everything that we've done with rules in these games is about paring the rules down, getting them to the point where turn sequences are incredibly fast without losing too much of the interest and the you know the, the reality of the thing. Mm. You know, we're trying to make them quick. Because if you're in one of these shows, you've got the whole show to get around, you want to play some games. We want people to be in our game and out of our game in 30 minutes. Yeah. And with today, I've seen people play that one, that one, that one, and that one during the course of the day. So. Well, speaking about the rules then, who designs the rules for the game? Where do they come from? Where does the madness lie? Ben, ben, would, argue, ben would argue there are no rules, yeah? Uh, but that's only because he's never read them, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to establish a very important point is at least 75% of the games can be played with no knowledge of the rules. Oh, there you go. Effectively and fun. Yeah. But of course, knowing them does help. And there are, there are basically some very good sets of rules that are very quick that you could adapt to anything else. And we are going to free source those online. We've got them on, put them on, put them on a website. We're just going to say, if people want to make up their own version of this, just do it, you yeah. know? Buy the models from wherever you get them from, play a quick game and it will take you 30 minutes to play. Yeah. Now, the last game is currently mid-game, um, so we'll have to float to the back. Okay. And he here we see everybody's favourite, Donald Trump, the massive dirigible. Trumpocalypse. I said it first time. Yeah, yeah. Has he been practising all day? Yes, yeah, that's all he's been practising for the past six months whilst practicing I've been doing all the work. <laughs> So that game's just finished with somebody escaping by luring a large Mexican with a taco to launch them across the wall into Mexico. I mean, in a way, this is very similar to the Brexit game, but it's got a bit more of an escape room about it. Yeah. So you search this board whilst fighting off Trump's minions yeah. um, and you search the buildings and vehicles and you, are, you find objects and then you have to work out how you'll use that object to cross the wall. Obviously, we have an idea about how it can be used, but we'd perfectly happily take anyone else's idea. So there's there's a element of uh, sort of role playing with it. If they find a, a spanner, then it's up to them how to use it. So, so for example, to get over on the on the on the seesaw that's built in the wall there, which is something that actually happened to the wall for Mexican and American. I children, remember seeing it. Yeah, we are a taco. Um, if you use the taco, there is a very large Mexican on the other side of it. And if you lure him with a taco, he will bounce you over that wall. Um, and there's another five ways that we know about to get across the wall. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, while we've been talking, someone else has just found the uh, the Mexican passport and managed to get through the passport control office. So again, that's another one of the methods. Turn up at the border wall, hand over your Mexican passport, and be deported. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a thing of genius. Uh, all of the games look absolutely magnificent. You're saying that people can uh, possibly look at some of the rules and bits and pieces online. Where would they go to do this? Yeah, so, so we're going to put them all online um, at the moment. If you go to our Twitter account, which is Bunny Badger underscore, is it? Yeah, yeah at Bunny, Bunny Badger, Badger underscore. Um, we'll we'll post a link in there and we'll we'll host them online and people can, people can grab them off there. And has anybody thought about what's going to be here for next year yet? Or is that a, we'll wait until two months beforehand and panic? No, we generally tend to leave the show here, go to the Fox, have a few beers, and then that's when we start thinking about the next one. But It's effective because I did that with some people from Black City Reapers last night, and I think they're going to put on Indiana Jones for me next year. Yeah. So nice. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but yeah, terrific seeing us, terrific seeing the tables as well. Thank it's you. been a, a fantastic day for you. And uh, let me know what you think below, folks, of all of these magnificent games and uh, which one you'd like to play the most. <laughs> Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.